Uh, my name is Bart Brechter. I'm head of Gardens and Landscape for the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And today we invite you into our garden to talk about uh, things and, and situations and plant material that we think that you uh, would enjoy to learn about and, and uh, have questions about for your own landscape. Specifically today we're going to talk about sod or grass or uh, turf, however you, w way you want to call it. And uh, it's probably the most uh, asked question or most talked about uh, problems in, in the Houston area, uh, especially this year. It's been particularly problematic um, due to the rains and then the lack of rain and then the high heat. Um, we're just now experiencing our first cold front and so uh, we've had a long, long growing season. So turf grass has been on my mind, and I, I hope it's been on yours. And if you have questions along the way, please feel free to uh, type in and ask us. And uh, we will uh, address those as, as promptly as we can without really interfering with what, what we're going to say. But uh, I don't mind taking questions along the way, so please uh, feel free. So the first uh, turf grass I'd like to discuss is St. Augustine, which is the predominant turf grass of Houston area. Um, it really came into Houston uh, around the 1920s, late 1920s, early 1930s. It started to become really popular. And it was, it was really a, a new turf grass, uh, one that, uh, that caught a lot of attention because it took our heat really well and it grew really fast through our long summer months. And um, it wasn't quite as aggressive as Bermuda, which was the turf grass of the time, of the turn of the 18th and 19th, or 19th and 20th century, excuse me. Um, Bermuda grass was the dominant. And then St. Augustine came in and solved a lot of problems that, uh, that Bermuda grass had. Uh, but now St. Augustine is our predominant uh, grass and therefore it's now showing us, or has been for a long time, showing us its own set of, of circumstances and challenges to deal with it in the Houston area. So we're going to go through some of those. We'll talk a little bit about Bermuda grass as well. Um, but first I want to talk about specifically St. Augustine and, and really what it is and, and how we need to uh, address it and look at it. Uh, Bermu uh, St. Augustine, excuse me, St. Augustine is a grass that grows along the surface of the soil. I have a, excuse me, I have a um, uh, little demonstration here. Can you see this, Joey? All right. All right, so we have uh, a St. Augustine stem, and this stolen here grows above the surface of the ground with the roots uh, attaching themselves along the soil as, as they go. So you have, a, you have a stem that's very vulnerable to all kind of diseases and, and circumstances. And, and so this is, this is the growing uh, structure, also the food storage of the plant. And then you have the, the leaves, which is, which is up here. And we'll refer back to this uh, here shortly, because then I'll show you some problems that this particular uh, stem has or stolen has. Uh, but I just wanted to demonstrate that and, and why this is easier to control than Bermuda, which the stem on the Bermuda or the stolen on the Bermuda grows below ground and, and is a little bit harder to, to control um, in, in your landscape. So we'll refer back to this in a minute. But I just wanted to show you, show you this to, to demonstrate the differences between uh, St. Augustine and Bermuda. So now let's talk about, let's talk about the, the care of or, or get into Bermuda grass a little bit, I mean, excuse me, I'm saying that again, St. Augustine grass a little bit more. Um, so St. Augustine um, can at times need a lot of water, but what's, so, what's good about St. Augustine is that you can, you can decide on how much water you're willing to give it, and it will respond to that. Um, at my personal home landscape, I water a lot less. Um, than I do here at, at Bao Ben. Not a whole lot less. We, we don't water a lot at Bao Ben. Um, what I like to do is I like to bring the grass to a, a, a point to, to where it needs the water instead of always constantly give it that water supply. So in, in your own landscapes, 
you don't necessarily need to water as much as most Houstonians do. Um, I would bring it to just to the point of stress. So what, what I mean by that, if, if you would step on the grass and in a course of two or three minutes, the grass does not respond or, 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 uh, or repair itself to stick back up, to, then it would need water. It would be stressed. Um, and, and then you could give it water. So about every three days is a good rule of thumb on that. Um, so with the watering, you want to water water deep enough so that the, uh, the the soil below the surface is also wet and stays stays moist. Not wet. You don't want a wet soil. You want a moist soil. Um, but if you water too much to where you have runoff, then then one the water isn't necessarily getting below the soil. It's just running off and into the street. You don't want to do that. So you want you want a slow water. Or you can even pulse your, if you have an irrigation system, you can pulse your irrigation system to water in the morning and then you can water the same day uh, in the evening. So you're watering twice, cut that to watering time down to, uh, to kind of alleviate the runoff, but, they, but you're still get, you're going to get the same amount of water on your landscape for that day. And that's fairly easy to do. If you have an irrigation system, and or if you don't, then it just takes a, a little bit extra time to put water out twice a day, and then and then I would wait about three days to to water again, and that's what we do here at uh, at the Bow Bend Gardens, or or even at at my own my own home, is is I would to pulse the water so I'd go twice a day, and that way I'm uh, I, again saving some water in the long run by not allowing the water to run off my property to stay onto the grass. Um, obviously, when it's hotter, you're going to have to water a little bit more. When it's cooler, like, a, like this morning, it's a beautiful morning, and uh, I won't talk too long because I know you want to get out in your yard and, and work. So uh, today's a beautiful day to do that. And, and you, So today, tomorrow, and, and probably the rest of the week, you won't have to water as much. Um, we haven't had rain in a while, but there's a nice dew on the ground this morning, which is keeping the soil moist. And so the, the watering of our landscapes throughout the Houston area would, would require a lot less for our sod and, and, and for our other landscape plants. And then as you go into winter, the, the winter you still would need to water, but again, you would cut back on water uh, uh, a lot, even though... Wintertime is a time when we notice our St. Augustine is going dormant, which is, uh, is not growing very active. Um, you, you still might need to mow once a month just to, just to keep it looking fresh and, and clean. But also, um, and also remember to water. If we go a long period of, uh, of the month without water, um, the plant is still alive. It still is going to re- need to require moisture to, to activate the cells and, and to, to keep those nice and firm and, and, and growing. And even though, uh, even though the tops aren't growing as much, the, the roots underneath are still active and still growing. So we have to keep that in mind as well. And then into spring. So as you get into spring, um, what I have found is, is in February, we seem to always get a warm up and then a cool back down. That's a good indicator, a good time around Valentine's Day. To, to recognize the need of more water as the grass starts to grow and also need of more for, or, or time to fertilize. And so now we're talking about fertilization. Let's, let's talk about the fertilization of your grass, of your lawn throughout the year. Um, so as indicated, February is a good time to remember that uh, your grass is starting to wake up from the winter months. Uh, or the winter month in Houston. And uh, so I would recommend a, a nice balanced fertilizer here at Bow Bend where, where we use organic fertilizers. So I use a balanced uh, a fertilizer of 6 to 4 ratio. And that's important to know because you want to apply your, your grass with a 3-1-2 ratio. So any combination 3-1-2. So like a 6-2-4 or a 15-5-10, a 21-7-14, all those can 
uh, can be fit into a three one two ratio and, and why that's important is that three is the heavy nitrogen or higher in nitrogen excuse me so so you want especially in the springtime you want to apply that nitrogen to start warming up and applying the nitrogen so that that nutrient can help produce the green foliage that you need um, and then again, I would fertilize uh, again in March um, when that when that fertilizer starts to deplete and it starts to really start warm up. The end of March is another good time to think about doing a fertilization of your of your turf grass. Um, and then after that, I wouldn't fertilize again until maybe midsummer when when your grass looks a little stressed, needs a little boost to help it get it through August because that's when August and September. Um, it really needs some help there. And then lastly, at the end of September, I would, I would do a light fertilization just to give it some, some nutrients through the winter months so that it could be ready to grow and have stored energy for the, the springtime. <coughs> Excuse me. And so that's, that's what I would recommend for fertilization. That's what we do at Bob Ben four times a, a year. Uh, is is recommended for for my turf grass, uh, but um, the most important thing I would I would like to to mention and to add is that if, in order for you to really know how much fertilizer you need or really n know what kind of nutrition that your grass needs, I would do a soil test. Do a soil test. You can go to a soil test at tamu. Dot edu and download a a uh, sheet to to turn in for your soil test. So you would you would it, it gives the instructions on how to to take a soil test. You put the soil that you gather from your turf grass and you put it in a Ziploc bag and you label it and you mail it in to uh, Texas A&M Soil Labs and they'll return it back with the recommended nitrogen you need. And the, it'll give you the pH balance of your soil. It'll give you the micronutrients that you have or, or lacking. And then you can adjust your personal um, fertilization needs to that soil test. So here at Bob Ben, we do soil tests twice a year. Once in the late spring and once in the late, uh, late summer or early fall. <coughs> Excuse me. And so... Uh, but if you don't want to do it twice a year, because I realize we're all busy, and I, I do at my, ha my home, I do at my home probably every, once every three years. And, and that's, more, that's sufficient enough to know your nutrient needs. The, the nutrients aren't going to uh, leave your soils as, as quickly uh, as they might here, as we're constantly um, having people here and, and there's different things going on at Bob Ben. Your home um, and your grass really needs about three, every three years to do a soil test. Um, so that's what I would recommend for uh, fertilizer and, and to know your landscape, to know your, your sod, uh, do, a, do a soil test. Um, excuse me, I'm going to take a drink of water real quick. Yeah, if there's, if there's a question, go ahead and, and give me a question. I'll be happy to, to uh, answer it. So the first one we have is from Jonathan Martinson, and he asks, we've had a lot of small, white, possibly moths swarming in the grass out in the shady area. Right. Any idea what they may be and if there's something harmful to St. Augustine? Right, good question. And, and if you can hold that question, I promise to talk about it here in a minute. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about... Um, other, <coughs> a little bit of other, some other things that uh, regards to uh, if you're trying to be organic um, for your landscape. Uh, about uh, September, I uh, I apply um, my sod with uh, with a little bit of molasses, and when I say a little bit, um, really just uh, just a, a spray. Or a dry molasses I spread on. It's about ten. I'm sorry. It's about five pounds per thousand square feet, which is very little. But what that does is it helps 
give the stressed sod and stressed area a little bit of added uh, help uh, with the microorganisms in the soil can, can use that uh, and it will also then kind of activate your soil to help it finish the summer um, with, with less stress. And so I, 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 that's not a fertilizer, it's, it's only an additive to help the sod as you go. And I do that in September um, when, when everything is tired. You might, you might even think about doing it in August. So now back to the question, and, and this is a good segue to talk about insects um, in that would harm the St. Augustine. So the question was the, the moths, and right now in Houston, well really all through the summer months, and, and, and right now in Houston, the Houston area, the moths are bad. Uh, that indicates that you have sod webworm. So if you walk through your grass and you see white moths come up, um, then, then underneath the larva, the, the worm that it's leaving, is sod webworm or, um, <coughs> excuse me, or army worm. Uh, Bermuda grass can get army worm. So St. Augustine gets army worm. But right now in Houston, the sod webworm is a problem. Um, I've had it as I've had it here at Bob Ben. Um, bad all summer. As a matter of fact, I, I did an area where I, I resodded. Uh, a certain a certain area of Bob Ben, and, and immediately the sod webworms got into that area and killed the sod, uh, the the sod that I put down. If you have established grass, the the worm is eating the the blade of the grass. It's not going to eat the stolen, and so the chance of regeneration is a lot greater. Uh, if you put down new sod, like I did, and the and the uh, sod webworm ate that, there's no roots uh, or the, the plant is already stressed so there's no roots to help it regenerate faster. So it does kill the grass. And, and so, um, so you have two different scenarios there. One where the, the, worm, the worm will eat the blade and the grass will regenerate if it's an established sod. You just need a little fertilization uh, maybe to uh, water just a little bit more. Um, to help that grass recover, um, I would I would go to to the your local store um, that's close to you, and you could buy a product called BT, which is a uh, organic. Uh, it's uh, spray it on. It uh, the worm ingest it, and the worm will then will then die. Um, it, it's uh, it's safe for animals, and it's safe for for your children and for yourself. To, sp to spray, um, I think in the stores you could buy it under the name Diapel, and, and that is an organic uh, spray for your lawn. If you don't want to go organic, you can, you can use a Bear Complete. Bear Complete has a, a product in it that will uh, get into the grass, and as the animal, as the insect eats it, then it will also die. So, either way, both of them work really well. Um, I like the BT. I like seeing that um, I'm being organic or, or being as uh, conscious to my environment as I can. And it, does, it works really well, so I would, I would recommend that first. Um, so as we're on the topic of insects, um, another insect to be mindful of is chinch bugs. Uh, chinch bugs can be first noticed in an area of your lawn that, look, that starts browning out. And chinch bugs will kill your grass because they'll eat everything. And actually what they're really kind of focusing on is they're focusing on the stolen itself and the root system. And so uh, the blades, reason why you see a brown spot in your lawn is because the grass blade is dying and turning brown. And you know, you know that uh, is an area that you might have an insect problem. So those are the two main problems with uh, insects in St. Augustine grass. Um, all the other insects are, I would consider minor and, and not really uh, something that I would be overly cautious about. Um, Joey, is there any other questions? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Peter Braz asks, uh, are there any ground covers that will fare well with uh, Xeriscaping? That's a good question. And I'm not, uh, I'm not too sav savvy on xeriscaping, but there are, 
there are some good ground covers. Um, you know, there's a, a ground cover uh, that doesn't... In, you're obviously looking to save water and conserve and to and to be mindful of of the water consumption. Um, there is a ground cover that doesn't need a lot of water consumption, and, and we use it. Uh, we use a little bit of it here, and that's the sandy leaf fig ivy, or any kind of. The, there's three types of fig ivies you can get, and you know the the one that you see growing on the side of a fence or the side of a house. Um, I wouldn't use that as a ground cover, but the sandy leaf needs a, a lot less water it doesn't like to climb and and it's a beautiful ground cover it does have a broader leaf which might might be nice in a cactus uh, situation where they will they will complement each other well or other uh, rocky situations if you're using a lot of rocks uh, that nice uh, light green color would look good with that so that's that's the first uh, plant material that comes to mind that would would work for you Joey, is there one more question before we move on to uh, fungal diseases? Sure. Now, this one is a little off turf care topic, but uh, it's <coughs> Carolyn Ginn who asks, how do you best care for knockout roses? Uh, she's replaced some longtime regular roses this year. Uh, good question, because... <coughs> Excuse me. Can you repeat the question? Okay, good. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. So the question was, is the best uh, care for knockout roses? How best to care for your knockout? So... Uh, with knockout roses, they're, they're really bred for the landscape specifically. So um, that be, that being said, you you know that knockout roses the fragrance isn't uh, doesn't have a lot of fragrance. But what's good about it is it doesn't have a lot of disease either. And so you can really treat knockout roses somewhat like a hedge, where you can trim it back any time because it's going to regrow quickly and bloom again. Um, knockout roses need uh, quite a bit amount of sunlight, six hours minimum uh, throughout the day. So if they're in a, in a shadier location, it's going to be harder for that knockout rose to bloom and also to get kind of bushy. Uh, you can fertilize knockout rose um, anytime you want. I would suggest not to fertilize it after September because the knockout rose is still a rose and it wants to go dormant in the winter time. Uh, you can prune it again anytime you want to to get it as thick as you want to to uh, to be a kind of a hedge like uh, and again um, all roses and I would recommend this for knockout all roses are great to uh, prune in uh, February uh, Valentine's Day is a good good key date to remember to trim knockout rose so again going back to the question how do you best care for knockout rose you can fertilize it anytime uh, you can you can prune it anytime. To, the more you prune it, the thicker it gets, and the more it's going to to bloom. Roses bloom on new growth, and so uh, anytime you can encourage as much new growth on that knockout rose, it would be best. So so then it would start to bloom again. Um, so thus, uh, my I hope that answered your question on on knockout rose. So now let's get back to turf grass. Uh, asking, uh, someone's asking to repeat one piece of information okay. uh, on treating brown patches. Yes, great, great question. We're going to uh, have a question about how to treat brown patch. So now we're going to get into turf grass and talk about fungal disease. And brown patch is a fungal disease. So um, on how I treat brown patch. First, let's talk about recognizing what brown patch looks like. So earlier I talked about chinch bugs and a browning in your, in your sod uh, with the chinch bug. Now that browning is an irregular shape where uh, a brown patch situation will brown in a circular shape. So you'll see the fungal disease and you'll see a br the brown, if you have a circle, uh, a, a fairly uniform circle in your lawn, you can recognize it as a fungal disease and, and that's brown patch. Um, the best, the best care, and, and I hope you don't feel like this is a cop out answer, but the best care is just a healthy lawn. Um, and so the the better you you prevent brown patch, or or the healthier your lawn is, uh, the less likely it is going to get the disease. But if you have the disease, which Bobbin gets quite frequently, and all of our landscapes get it, because not all of our turf is always the healthiest at the same time. 
Um, the best thing I do is once I first see it, I, I go, to the, go to the grocery store and buy yellow cornmeal. And I spread, spread it out like a fertilizer. And just put a nice even um, spread of yellow cornmeal in, on your lawn. I know that sounds weird, but cornmeal has beneficial properties that uh, suppress fungal growth. And, and that wipes it out for me. Um, but if, if, um, if you do see it and, and you don't have cornmeal, I would, I would cut back on water a lot because that fungus is reacting to a moisture situation. And especially in the fall when we get the nice cool nights like it is this morning. And then it starts to warm up real quick like I'm sure we're going to be here soon. Then that's a good kind of optimal brown patch or fungal growing condition. So cut back on your irrigation a lot and then, and then focus on, on treating that area for for fungus uh, again I use the cornmeal you can put a little bit of molasses with that as well that will help uh, if you don't want to go the organic way there are fun fungicides in the store that you can you can get and those those work really well um, and, uh, and 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 they just take care of the problem but really try to focus on eliminating the problem before it happens so uh, proper nutrition helps, and not too much nitrogen because that, that can cause um, a situation that is optimal for growth of fungus. Um, and cut back on water, again reiterating the fact that to, the, to prevent is better than to, to react. And so doing those preventatives up front will, will go a long way. Um, you can also, um, like uh, first of October, go ahead and put out cornmeal even, even though you don't have it, and that will help suppress it as well. And, and so the brown patch is one, um, probably the main problem uh, that Houston's seeing and sees in your turf grass. Also another turf grass that actually Bob in, um, I just got a, uh, my, my uh, sod and my turf test back, and, and right now we're experiencing a fungus called take-all patch. And with that, that really just kills big areas of, of your lawn. And, um, and I noticed it actually because I tested for uh, different uh, uh, diseases and insects. And, and it came back saying that I do have sod webworm, which we already knew. But, but I didn't know I had this take-all patch. Um, again, so now I'm, I'm using... Uh, different methods for take-all patch. Uh, uh, organic fertilizers have microorganisms in them and different nutrients that uh, counteract uh, fungal diseases. So, so take-all patch can be suppressed by that. Um, again, going back to the cornmeal, that could be suppressed by that. Cutting back on water and, and making sure you, you fertilize and, and you take care of the nutrient of your, of your soil and your sod will help with the take-all patch. Again, and then if, if none of that works, go, go to your, your store and buy, uh, a, again, a fungicide that's specific to uh, fungal problems in your turf grass, uh, such as take-all patch. Uh, you notice take-all patches will be different than, than brown patch because take-all patch really kind of moves through your landscape in not, uh, not necessarily circles or not necessarily a spot, but just in big swaths of your, of your grass. And so if you see a big area that's starting to die back, you can, you can point to a fungal disease, and that would be take-all patch. Uh, there is one other fungal problem. Where did I put that uh, piece of grass? Anyway, excuse me one second. <coughs> Where'd it go? Anyway can't find it but if you look on your on your grass and you have uh, on the blade and you have little kind of gray spots that's also a fungus it's not killing the grass but it's all it but it's suppressing growth um, it um, it's always prevalent in the in the fall I know we have it here every fall uh, and it's hard to get rid of. Again, it's not killing your grass. It's not really hurting your grass, except the fact that if, if it gets very rampant, which um, 
excuse me, it's a, it's, when it gets rampant, it can suppress the growth. The, the fungus is, is called, um, shoot, the name just escaped me. I just had it. I'll, I'll remember in a minute and I'll come back to you. Sorry about that. But uh, again, if you have if you have little gray spots on your your grass, I wouldn't be alarmed. It is a fungus, but it's not going to hurt your grass. Um, do you have any other questions, Joey? As we as we we're fine. Okay, good. Uh, so lastly, let's talk about weeds. Um, the best solution for weeds is the maintenance that we've already talked about. Um, the thicker the grass, the, 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 mo the better it suppresses opportunity for weeds to grow. Um, weeds really need a, kind of an area to start growing in. So if you have a bare spot in your grass, that's prime opportunity for weeds to grow through it. If you, you cut your grass too short, and I haven't talked about cutting grass length, which we can, we can in a minute. But if you cut your grass too short and allow sunlight to get down to the soil, that's opportunity for seeds to germinate and for weeds to grow. Uh, so the thicker and the healthier the grass is, the best suppression of weeds. Now there are two weeds that uh, really plague me at Bow Bend, and I can quickly bend down and get both of them. So the first weed uh, that I want to talk about is uh, this weed here. It has a little white flower and it has these little little uh, bulbs that uh, and this is this is called Virginia buttonweed and this little bulb is is the button that's referring to. Uh, that's a seed pod and Virginia buttonweed is a real real problem um, here at Bow Bend. It's uh, it, it's very hard to get rid of. It, uh, it spreads in mats and kills the grass. And so it's creating, it's, it's creating an area for itself to grow. So it's suppressing the grass to grow. Uh, so it, it's a very hard one to get rid of. Uh, the best way i found to get rid of it is to, is to weed it out by hand. And then in the springtime, I put down a corn gluten mill. And corn gluten suppresses uh, seed germination, so um, so I do that so the the new seeds in the in the spring won't will not germinate. So it's a pre-emergent uh, herbicide, uh, corn gluten meal. You can find it in feed stores, and uh, it it works really well to suppress the weed growth in the springtime. Uh, the second one, which is really hard to get rid of, and you see I just quickly bent down and picked it up because it's pretty prevalent is this weed here it's really succulent looking it actually looks like a grass and it has these grass uh, shaped leaves this is called dove weed this weed is another really uh, tough one to get rid of both of these weeds will grow in in conditions that are dry and wet um, so um, but the germination of the seeds it needs to be really really wet so if you are uh, keeping your sod uh, moist but not wet and, and putting it to that uh, almost stress level that we talked about first, then the, the growth of these would be harder to, to, uh, to germinate. But again, the dollar, I mean, the dove weed is, um, is a hard one to get rid of. Uh, no herbicide kills, kills it. Same with the... Same with the uh, Virginia buttonweed, no herbicide kills it. So uh, it's really hard to get rid of. Again, pull it out and then manage it by hand as soon as you can. There's, uh, there's two other weeds that are fairly easy to, to control just by changing your irrigation or changing how you manage the grass. One is the dollar weed. Dollar weed has to have a really moist uh, environment. So areas in your yard that don't get, enough, don't get a lot of sun and, and stays moist, it really, really uh, helps that dollar weed to grow. So cut back on your irrigation, dry that area out, and you'll see the dollar weed start to, to diminish. It's really, really easy to control the dollar weed. Another one is uh, the strawberry. Wild strawberry uh, needs moisture, but what it also needs, it also needs an area where the grass is not very thick, not very tall. 
And so if you grow, if you let your grass grow higher it, for, just say for like two months, raise, raise your mower up higher than than the than the two to three inches go go as high as it can and and just mow it at that length it will shade out the the wild strawberry and that will will die and, and you won't have a problem with that again cut back on water with with the the wild strawberry as well so let's talk about cutting your your sod and managing it that way um, two inches is about as low as i would go um, two and a half is is really what looks the best to me. Three three is what's recommended, but for me it looks a little too long. So I I, I tend to go about two and a half inches. Um, recommended is three inches. And again, if you want to start suppressing weeds, you can you can uh, go up higher. You can also vary your mowing so you're not mowing at the same height every time. So go up all the way and mow, and then bring it down in stages and then let it grow long and go up again. What that does is you're allowing some weeds to grow and set seed, and as, as they set seed, you then you would cut it down and, and harvest all those seeds so they don't get back into your, your lawn. If you mulch instead of bag, um, then go ahead and you want to you wanna mow a little bit more frequently so that you're suppressing, when I would say more frequently, about uh, definitely mow once a week. Um, and, and then make sure that you're, you're getting those weeds before they set seed so you're not encouraging more, more weeds to grow. And so that's are my, my recommendations. Joe, do you have any more questions? Not at this time. You want to do Bermuda? Yeah, I'm going to quickly talk about Bermuda, switch gears just a little bit. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Bermuda grass, uh, like I said when I first started, Bermuda grass used to be the dominant uh, sod or, or grass for the Houston homes back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, before uh, St. Augustine really uh, was became fashionable. Actually, uh, it was it was one of those. St. Augustine used to be what zoysia is today, where everybody, uh, if you have zoysia, it's kind of a new grass to us, and it's kind of you know something that's exciting. And, and, and you might want to put it in your in your yard because there's not very many, not very many people have it. Well, St. Augustine used to be the same way, and so as Houston uh, grew and as as time went on, St. Augustine took over uh, the Bermuda grass as far as as people's uh, interest in it and, and planting it. But Bermuda grass is still a good grass for for certain certain circumstances. Um, if, if you go to any sports field. Uh, I know my sons are in football right now, and uh, all their grasses that they play on is Bermuda grass, uh, mixed with a lot of weeds, of course. Because, uh, but it's it's uh, predominantly Bermuda grass, and and that grass is used because the stolons, like I mentioned earlier, the stolons grow below the surface of the soil. Therefore, the the trampling and the traffic that it takes, I mean that it gets. It, it could grow back from that to relatively uh, easy. St. Augustine couldn't do that on a sports field. It would kill the it would kill the stolons, and the St. Augustine wouldn't grow back. So that's what makes Bermuda grass so good for our recreation areas, our parks, and and our sports fields. But if you have it in your in your lawn, or if you have it for your grass, uh, it's softer than St. Augustine. Uh, you can. It, it has less pests, pests and diseases overall. Um, if it dies, it it really uh, it, it it really can die fast, but uh, it rarely will. And and another, but one negative about it is it goes completely dormant in the winter time, where it really it browns out everywhere. Where uh, Saint Augustine, you still have kind of a dullish green throughout the winter. And, and I, I believe that's probably the reason why it's so popular. It, it came into fashion because it gil, still gave us kind of a green feel where Bermuda grass will go completely brown altogether. It'll come right back in the springtime and, and be really uh, lush and pretty. Uh, and it takes, it, it takes up uh, nutrients really fast. So fertilizing it uh, can, can really green it up really fast. Uh, another down uh, kind of a negative of of Bermuda grass. It's hard to control keeping it out of your flower beds or keeping it kind of where you want it. 
Um, St. Augustine's real good because, because you can easily trim it and keep it where you want it. Bermuda grass, because of the nature of how it grows, you, it could pop up in your, in your flower beds or you know, in, air, in places that you don't, you don't expect it to be. So it can be a little bit difficult that way. Either way, Bermuda grass is still a, a, a good one to, to grow, especially if you want if you use your lawn a lot and you want to lay down in, in your lawn and, and really feel soft, and, and Bermuda grass is a good one for that. Uh, really, uh, the diseases for it, it could get some take-off patch. Uh, it can also get, uh, it can get uh, army worm. Um, other than that, Bermuda grass is, is fairly carefree um, for, that, for that reason. Any, any questions, Joey? Because we're about wrapped up. I, think, uh, I thank you for your time. Right. Okay. So Joey reminded me that I need to talk about future topics, and and that's ex that's excellent because uh, uh, in the next couple of months we're going to talk about camellias, and and camellias is a good time, good topic to talk about in the winter because that's when they grow, and we'll talk about why they. I mean, that's when they bloom. Excuse me, and we'll talk about why they bloom in the winter time, and we'll talk about uh, the care for them throughout the year to help keep them pretty. And, and at one time, camellias, camellias were a, a really treasured plant like roses are, are grown for. Camellias used to, be, used to be the rose of the winter or the queen of the winter. And, and they've gone out of fashion here recently. And, and hopefully the dis discussion and conversation can perk your interest or, or help answer problem questions that the camellias might have. And, uh, and yes, and as we go forth, I want, we want to do this way more often. This is our first, uh, first uh, Facebook opportunity to do this. We, we would like to do this more. So your suggestions on topics would be great. Uh, the more topics we have to cover, the more opportunities we have to answer your questions and to, to help educate all of us on how to take care of our landscapes here in Houston. So again, I appreciate, appreciate your time. Tell your friends, tell your people that you, uh, that you want them to learn, and, and I look forward to uh, talking with you in the future. And yes. Let them know that they can continue to ask questions, and we'll follow up with their comments. Okay, Joey reminded me, again, he's a, a great producer, because uh, you can ask your questions at, even when we're off air, and we will follow up and answer those questions as, as we go or as you submit them. So please continue to ask questions. Again, at, tell your friends that we are just starting this and we would like to uh, grow our audience. We would like to, this to be very helpful for the Houston uh, people and really get horticulture and growing and landscaping uh, to be part of uh, people's life again. And remember, it used to be. I'd like to see that more. So again, my name is Bart Brechter. I'm head of Gardens and Landscape at the Museum of Fine Arts, and I really appreciate your time this morning and today, and have a good day. Thank you.